Great, thank everybody for coming, and I'd like to thank um, Megan for the for the great introduction with sort of where the science is today. So, in part of my background, I think about um, not only hazard, and, and AFS it, ASF is certainly a hazard, but I also like to think about risk. So we know it survives in feed. There's a lot of information that it can survive in feed, but one of the big questions that I have is how would it get there? And that's where there's a lot of information that we don't know. So at the University of Minnesota, I have a group of people, I'll talk about them a little bit um, at the end, um, but we've ta undertaken sort of five key things that we're looking at now. One is a risk decision tree. Uh, the blockchain, how blockchain could be applicable. Um, quick show of hands, anybody in here know a lot about blockchain? Hey, we have a few. Fantastic. Um, then we also conducted two um, supply chain uh, events, workshops with both the vitamin industry and with the soy industry. And then we would like to talk about some emerging science that we have going on regarding a surrogate. So first, when we put together this risk decision tree, we use the Food Safety Modernization Act um, as our base. Um, how many folks in the room are familiar with FSMA? Fantastic. It simply is the basis for how feed and feed safety is regulated in the U.S. Um, basically, any feed manufacturer supplying feed or feed ingredients in the U.S. will have to, have to comply with FSMA. Um, we use that as the model, understanding that there is a lot of detail in FSMA. And, and, and there's different ways that people in the industry are adapting to the requirements that are imposed by FSMA. But what we found is that when you really look at different types of feed ingredients in that FSMA context, you find that, that risk is really related to, to, to about six principles. One, what's the disease status in the region where that feed or that feed ingredient is produced? And what types of regulatory prohibitions would influence the distribution of that feed? Um, where is an individual feed manufacturer, feed ingredient manufacturer on their FSMA compliance journey? Um, what types of manufacturing parameters are used to create these feed ingredients and, and complete feeds? And then, really important from a recontamination perspective, what types of sanitation and sanitary transport conditions and criteria are being applied in that complex supply chain that we have? We're going quick. That's all you get. If you would like more, let us know. Moving to blockchain, I feel like I'm on a whirlwind tour of everything feed right now. Blockchain is not really in the feed supply chain. It has a lot of um, aspects about it that could be really influential. It's being used more in the food supply chain right now than in feed. Walmart is a big proponent of that. The key criteria that are important for us today, it is a decentralized system. No one entity owns the data. Um, because of the way blockchain functions, the data cannot be changed over time. It also works with a consensus validation approach. So when data is entered into the system, everybody validates it. That's why it becomes immutable. And there's also security credibility. So some blockchains are very public and open, some are private. But because there's all these people in there validating it, you just can't change the data. One of the downsides for blockchain is the data is dependent upon the people that are entering the data. So it has traceability and it has transparency. It doesn't necessarily always equate to trust because you're still dependent upon the people that are inputting the data. It is being used in the animal supply chain right now. TE Pork in Vietnam um, are currently managing a variety of their animal species through blockchain that are actually going all the way to the consumer and they allow the consumers to see all and um, regulatory professionals throughout that, that supply chain all kinds of different health information about how those animals were raised, where they were raised, what kind of information they were raised under. Animals are, tend to be more individual characters, so when you move into the implementation in the feed industry, traceability really becomes an issue because traceability is often lost at the largest common denominator. So when we have uh, ocean-going transport vessels or barges or rail cars, you lose some of the traceability back to individual farm where product is produced. Skip ahead. Vitamin supply chain work. 
feel like we're on a whirlwind again. Um, I'd like to thank the collaborating companies that helped us with this work. We brought together and we convened a workshop that included all of these entities. And basically what we did is we mapped the vitamin supply chain. One of the key things, one of the key takeaways that we had with the vitamin supply chain is that manufacture, pure vitamin manufacture is occurring primarily not in the United States. Most of it is actually occurring in China. But we have to remember that that pure manufacturing is supplying not only the feed industry, it is also supplying the food industry. If any of you are taking a vitamin or consuming milk with a vitamin D or allowing your children to take a supplement, a vitamin supplement, or consume milk with vitamin D, you are trusting the manufacturing of those Chinese suppliers. In addition, those same suppliers are also manufacturing pharmaceutical grade vitamins that are going into our sickest populations around the world. These plants have to operate at that pharmaceutical GMP level. They're not creating vitamins just to go into the feed chain. For most of the vitamins, because of the economics of the vitamin supply chain, they are shipped pure to the destination of origin. Some of the differences, though, are choline and vitamin A, which have to have a stabilizer added at the point of production. For vitamin A in particular, that involves gelatin, so there is a feedback loop with an animal product, but if you actually think about how gelatin is manufactured with the heat conditions, um, depending upon the biosecurity uh, in those plants and the, the, food, the food safety processes in those plants, um, contamination of that gelatin should be a lower risk, but it still exists. But most importantly, we found in the vitamin supply chain that there are a lot of brokers, traders, emerging suppliers that can be blending throughout the supply chain and in inadvertently increasing the risk for all of you and our recommendation is to think hard about how you're using um, those emerging suppliers uh, particularly as uh, in a cost method. So most vitamins are produced in China, most of them are produced under pharmaceutical GMPs, most of them are shipped in pure forms. All three of those, are, particularly the last two, mitigate the risk of contamination of virus in that supply chain. Choline and vitamin A may have additional ingredients at point of manufacture. Again, if you think about choline though, remember it has to also serve the pharmaceutical industry. So even though I said corn cobs, they're very special corn cobs because they're also supplying the pharmaceutical industry and these brokers, traders, and emerging suppliers create a risk, but that is a controllable risk as you think about your sourcing practices within your own supply chain. Moving to our other workshop, we talked with soy suppliers. This is the list of the participants we had in that workshop. Similar to the vitamin supply chain, we mapped the soy supply chain, focusing primarily on the soy protein side of that supply chain. So soybean meal and downstream processes. One of the really interesting things about soybean meal is soybean meal or soy proteins have trypsin inhibitor in it. It's a nutritional issue requires heat to inactivate that trypsin inhibitor. The heat that is required to inactivate that trypsin inhibitor is also likely to the level, needs verification, likely to the level that would also inactivate the ASF virus. However, soy hulls don't undergo that same treatment. So, that, so soy hulls have a different risk profile than soy proteins. And with the complexity of the supply chain, sanitation, sanitary transport, potential for recontamination um, is really important to address in the soy supply chain. So soy proteins have to inactivate trypsin inhibitor, should inactivate the virus. Soy hulls may present a risk. Recontamination post-processing throughout the entirety of our feed supply chain will continue to present a risk. And this group also established priorities for additional work. And one of theirs is inactivation of virus in feed matrices, primarily using a surrogate virus. Um, with, with the restrictions on being able to investigate ASF into certain laboratories, it's really important that we think about having a surrogate virus. And I'm looking at my virologist in the audience and hoping I do justice to his work. Um, so the virus uh, model that we're talking about, we're calling it a risk-free in situ non-animal virus. And it focuses on an algal virus called 
Emiliana Huxley I. I think I did it right. Um, or EHV. The reason EHV is so important to us is it's very closely related to ASF and yet it is completely non-pathogenic to humans and all animal species. It only infects algae. And in fact, it's really important in the natural ecosystem to help control algae blooms. But it acts a lot like ASF. So it, it, it's, it's animal-like in the way it works with macropenocytosis and with budding. And it has more similarities to animal-like megaviruses than really like ASF than any other virus that's currently out there. So when we think about what it takes to be a good surrogate, there's this whole list of stuff. Um, work in our laboratory has already, in, actually in, in Dr. Schroeder's laboratory, has already shown that, that uh, EHV meets all of these criteria. And interestingly enough, it is so innocuous and so non-infective that it actually means you can test it in situ. So you can put it in feed. You can run it through a pilot plant. You could use it with um, normal standard feed processing conditions and then actually measure its true survivability after those. So we have work that we're working on now to truly firm up and make certain 100% um, that, that it is, that it is a great surrogate, um, but this is the direction that we're headed. I would also like to thank the team. This is a huge team. I just got the pleasure of representing the team. I hope I did everyone justice, but you want to know what keeps me up at night? It's this. Is it going to play? There we go. First, let's recognize what an incredible job this farmer did in setting up this wheat harvest. But we do have ingredients out there that undergo basically almost no physical processing under any condition that would inactivate ASF. Because what happens in the next two seconds is 30 wild pigs run out of that little tiny patch of wheat. Um, but wheat is one of those. Just in the U.S. alone, we know that wheat and wheat flour are already responsible for many food safety outbreaks, including E. coli, because of the lack of processing that our flour products undergo from any type of heat treatment, and we have wildlife in our fields. That is also true in many countries around the world where grain products are produced that have wild boar endemic in those regions. This is the type of crop that keeps me up at night from a risk perspective.